Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you all back, and uh, we'll get on with our next half hour, and we're going to stay in Daniel. But uh, first, I want to again <coughs> thank my television audience, as well as all you folks here, for all of your kind letters, your financial help, and your prayers. Uh, I just want you all to know we can't do it without it. And uh, even though these are rough financial times, we keep looking for things to start diving, but they're not. And uh, they're holding up. In fact, I think maybe uh, been increasing, hasn't it, honey, the last couple of days? My, you can't imagine the box of letters we've had each day the last two days. So thank you out there in TV land, how we, uh, our hearts go out to you. And again, we always are mindful of uh, those of you who write that you're fighting disease of one kind or another or financial problems, and we cherish taking those requests into the throne room. We really do. All right, for those of you here in the audience, we'll go back for just a moment to Daniel to just pick up what's on the board that we're in book number 80. And uh, I don't know how many of these programs will continue through Daniel, but we'll take it as it comes, verse by verse. And so if you'll come back with me to Daniel chapter 1, and uh, I purposely deferred a couple things because I didn't want to have too much introductory stuff, but I've got to get it in someplace. So what I think I'll do is come back now to chapter 1, and uh, verse 1, I think that's really all we need. Why, when Israel was so connected to their God, why did he permit these pagan Babylonians to come in and do battle with them. Well, there's going to be reasons, and I'll show you in just a minute. But in Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And of course, like we've already seen, he took all of the upper crust captive back to Dab Babylon. And then several years later, he came back and destroyed the city and the wall and the gates and the temple. And then he came back a third time and took almost everything that was left of the population. All right, so why? Why? Well, you've got to remember that Israel was always under God's blessings, but also his chastisement. Come back with me now to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. And this is a twofold prophecy. Now this took place the first time, like we've just seen now with Nebuchadnezzar coming and taking the people of Israel captive. It happened again when the Romans came in in 70 AD, and they didn't just take them back to one place, they scattered them from one end of the world to the other. But it was still two of the dispersions that were in Israel's future. All right, the first one, the one where they went to Babylon. Leviticus chapter 26 32 and 33, but it's a valid prophecy even for today. And I use it whenever I speak of the times of the signs or the signs of the time, how that this is already fulfilled with Israel back in the land. But you've got to remember that it was originally directed to Israel with regard to 600 B.C. because Leviticus is way back in the time of Moses. See, now here again, the scoffer cannot comprehend that. Now, here, way back, hundreds of years before the fact, Moses is predicting this Babylonian captivity. And then get a little closer to it, Isaiah predicts the name of the emperor that will send them back. I mean, that's what's all so unique about Scripture. You know, I heard one of the major commentators the other day interviewing one of the major scoffers of right-wing television. And I don't like to use names. I don't want to get in trouble if I can help it. But the guest said, now, wait a minute. He said, you are always condemning this network. Have you ever listened to it? No way. Well, how can you condemn something you've never listened to? Isn't that right? Sure. Same way with this book. Do you know that 99 out of 100 people who scoff at this book have never read one verse of it? All they go by is their gut feeling and hearsay. And, and all I tell people, listen, just realize how intrinsically I used the illustration way back in one of the first programs, 20 years ago. Just like a finely tuned Swiss watch with all of its intricate movements. Take any one of them out and it'll stop. But you see, that's this book. It is so put together 
intrinsically. All right, Leviticus chapter 26, drop down to verse 32, where God says through Moses, I will bring the land, that is the land of Canaan, I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies who dwell therein, that is the Canaanites at this point in time, they shall be astonished at it. At what? The desolation. How a productive, beautiful strip of land could so f completely fall apart. But God did it with earthquakes. He did it with pestilence. He did it with uh, drought. Stop raining. See? All right. So here it is. All foretold about uh, almost a thousand years ahead of time. Now verse 33. I will scatter you among the Gentiles. I will draw out a sword after you. In other words, there'd be tremendous loss of life. And your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Now the next verse. Then when Israel is out of the land and everything is destroyed, then God says the land, the promised land, the land of Canaan, shall enjoy her Sabbaths. Well, what was the Sabbath in Israel's history? They had to leave the land fallow every seventh year from the time that they came in under Joshua. Leave it fallow. I'll give you enough extra on the sixth year and the first year that you won't miss it. But did they believe God? No, they kept on farming it. They kept on taking out the fruit. And so God says, it's going to get them. It's going to get them. All right, here it is. So even then, when you're out of the land and there's no production, there's no farming, there's no fruit trees growing, then shall the land rest and enjoy her what? Sabbath. Now, like I said at the beginning of the other program, last program, 490 years are in one of these categories. And 490 years, Israel never gave the land the Sabbath rest. So how many years did it owe God? 70. 70 times 7 is 490. All right, so God says, I'm going to get it. And so he permitted these pagans to bring destruction into their country, to take them out captive, so that the land could enjoy its made-up Sabbath. Seven years into 490 and every seventh year. All right, now there was a second reason that Israel was so guilty. Who wants to guess? What was their problem? Oh, come on. Idolatry. Oh, they had a pagan god under every green tree. And the temple was still operating, but that didn't make any difference. They were still worshiping all the pagan gods and goddesses. Unbelievable. I still can't get over it as often as I've read it and taught it. How these people, brilliant, they were then just like they are today. And yet so ignorant that they would worship idols of gold and silver and stone and ignore the God of it. It's unbelievable. But they did. All right, turn with me now to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 44. And we'll see how this becomes part of the problem. And this is why they hated Jeremiah so horribly that they threw him into a dungeon, you know. <coughs> Jeremiah 44. Dropping in at verse 15. Jeremiah 44, let's drop in at verse 15. Now this is hard to comprehend. And yet it's exactly what the book says. It describes it so perfectly. Now even the book of Hosea, what was the problem? They were following after all these pagan gods. Those of us that were up in Israel just the other day, up in the northern part, we saw the old uh, altar of Dan. The first tribe to go into abject idolatry. They found the whole thing now. The altar and everything. And under dirt for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. But just to prove that the Bible was not kidding, Dan was the first to go into idolatry. 
with all their pagan immorality. See? All right, Jeremiah 44, dropping in at verse 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelled in the land of Egypt. Now, there are a lot of Jews that ran down to Egypt to escape Babylon. All right, and that dwelt in the land of Egypt. In Pathros, they answered Jeremiah. Now, look what their response when Jeremiah accuses them of their idolatry. They said, verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of Jehovah, we will not listen to you, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense. You remember, that was part of pagan worship. And we will burn incense unto the who? Queen of heaven. See, it was always the female goddesses that were at the top of everything. And they would send these people into the most abject immorality. Unbelievable, see? And that's who they're worshiping, these female goddesses. All right? And we will pour out drink offerings under her. Now remember that drink offering, because we're going to come to why Daniel won't drink the wine of Nebuchadnezzar. And she pours out, and we will pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. Now what a lie, the next statement. For then, while they were in their pagan idolatrous worship, they claimed, for then, since we left off burning incense, the queen of heaven, pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted... All things. They were destitute. They needed this and they needed that because they had left off worshiping the female goddesses. What a lie. All right. Now verse 19. When we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, we did make her cakes to worship her and we did pour out drink offerings unto her. Without our men, the women just went ahead and did it anyway. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out the drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship and pour out drink offerings without her? And then Jeremiah said, verse 20, to the men, to the women, and to all the people who had given him that answer, saying, the incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings, your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? And did it not come to his mind? And what did he do? He brought the Babylonians. And they went under abject misery. Now you've got to realize too, the, the ancients, especially the upper crust, did they ever exercise any human rights? They didn't know what it was. They would kill left and right and never blink an eye because they were just serfs. They were slaves. I'll never forget, I guess it was the first time we went to Israel, we could still go up the rampart to Masada. Can't do it anymore. They got it all fenced off. I guess it was too dangerous. But see, when the Romans besieged Masada, I trust you all know Masada, that high mountain that they had a fortress on the top. When the Romans besieged Masada, the only way to the top was up what they called the snake trail. And you just, it's only about three feet wide. Well, two men could hold off an army. So they knew they would never capture those 900 Jews by going up the snake trail. So what'd they do? They started building a rampart from the north. 10,000 Roman troops plus who knows how many Jewish slaves. And they start building this earthen rampart from down on the desert floor all the way to within 10 feet of the top. And I'll never forget it as long as I live. As I was walking up that with our Jewish guide, he says, you know, Les, no one will ever know how many Jewish bodies were just simply left to die, covered up the dirt, and they just kept on going. Well, see, that was the attitude towards the human. It's still like that in a lot of places today, but more so in antiquity. Human life meant nothing to these people. You could just as well cut off a chicken's head. Didn't make any difference. And so always keep these things in mind that when these people went into a captivity, 
they were now going to be subjected to no human rights as we understand them. All right, now then let's come back. We'll pick up where we left off in the last program in Daniel. I think we're still in chapter 1. And uh, we'll just pick up where... Uh, verse 9. Now let's look at verse 8, just for a review. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat or food, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuch that he might not defile himself. Now there again, you have to understand, what was the mentality? How could a good, righteous Jew like little 15-year-old Daniel eat this meat that had been offered to a pagan female goddess? How could they drink wine that before they even did anything, they would pour out a portion of it as a libation for the pagan gods? And Daniel says, I can't do that. Well, you know, Paul had a little bit of controversy with that, didn't he? And he says, it won't bother me because he says, I know those dumb idols can't do anything. But on the other hand, he did condescend and he says, that's all right. If it's going to be offensive that I eat meat offered to the idols, the, the uh, temples, he says, I'll never eat another bite of meat as long as I live. So it's always been that controversy, see? All right, but now then, back to Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince or the top man of the eunuchs. Now, does that ring a bell? I'm going to use two scriptures. Turn with me first up to Romans. Up to Romans. Well, <laughs> I got a, another one of those age-precipitated, what Floridans call, senior moment. <laughs> I, wanna, I know it's in Roman, but I've forgotten my reference. Can you believe that? Where was I going to go? No. No, I know what it was. Romans 15. Thank you. <laughs> it still helped. Romans 15. For our television audience, I guess I should tell them I'm sick today and I'm not up to par, so bear with me. Romans chapter 15 and uh, verse, I think it's 3. Romans chapter 15, verse 3. No, it's verse 4. Sorry about that if you've written it in your notebook already. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Now this is the Apostle Paul writing to us. For whatsoever things were written aforetime. Old Testament. They were written for our, what's the word? Learning, not doctrine. You don't find the plan of salvation in the Old Testament. You won't find the Christian walk as we experience it in the Old Testament. That was all law. That was Israel. But here it is. It's still profitable, as Paul says. All Scripture is profitable. Of course it is. All right, so whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now, Take the young lad, 15 years old, down in a foreign country, in a foreign palace, where any slip of the tongue, his head is off. Don't you imagine he was homesick for Jerusalem? But did Daniel ever turn against his God? Never. All right, another one I like to look at is Joseph. I think rather than going back and read it, you all know the account of Joseph. My goodness, the young man too probably in a late teen situation, and his brothers connived against him. And first they were going to put him to death, and then they thought better of that, so they threw him in the pit. And what do you suppose old Joseph is thinking about now? 
Is this all part of God's doing? And that's typical. I mean, we're all human. They were too. All right, then he ends up in the house of Potiphar, and he gets put in the slammer because she falsely accused him or propositioning her. And how long was he in, in prison? I think about 10 years. Well, now, for 10 years in an Egyptian prison was not a Sunday school picnic. It was like a dungeon. But did Joseph ever give up? No. No. And the day finally came when God put his thumb on Joseph, and by a supernatural uh, turn of events, Joseph becomes the second man in Egypt and becomes the sustainer then of his own family. All right, now come back to Daniel the same way. Daniel now is there because of who he is. He's a believer. He's a Jew. And yet he never relinquishes his faith in the God of Abraham. He never gives it up. See? All right. Verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince or the head of of the eunuchs, which, of course, Daniel is now, remember. That's the first thing they did, even as a young lad. They neutered him. And so he's a eunuch. But he never stopped trusting the God of Abraham. All right, now in verse 10. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear, my lord the king, who hath appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse looking than the children who are of your sort? In other words, Daniel. I've got to keep you looking as good as the Babylonian kids or my head is off. And so Daniel says, sorry, but I don't need your Babylonian rich food and drink. You can bring me, what's the word in the King James? Pulse. Now the best way I can explain pulse is Gerber's baby food. <laughs> Am I right? Pretty close. It was strictly vegetable. It was ground to where it was just a mush. That was pulse. And that's all Daniel wants for himself and his three friends, see? All right, come back to the text. <clears throat> Verse 10, the last part. See, like I just said, they thought nothing of cutting somebody's head off. And so he says, Your faces will be working, looking worse than the children which of your sort. Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. What's he talking about? Beheading. That's nothing new for the Middle East. It's been there for centuries. See? All right. Now look what Daniel says. Verse 11. He said to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove or test thy servants, I beseech you, ten days, and let them give us pulse, Gerber's baby food, for ten days, and water to drink. No wine, just water and pulse. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's food, and as thou seest, deal with us. If we start looking pale and impoverished, and you can profit by getting rid of us, go ahead. But Daniel knows it's not going to happen. All right? <clears throat> Verse 15. <clears throat> At the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children, that is, of Babylon, which did eat the portion of the king's food. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their food and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse, just a ground-up vegetable. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. What does that tell you? Those kids were smart. <laughs> Those kids had the answer to... Now remember, they're kids. They're still only 15 years old. But God is using them now to confound all the intelligentsia of Babylon. All right? And so... Verse 10 again, 20 again, in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired them, he found them, these four Jewish lads, 
ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers <coughs> that were in all his realm from one end of the empire to the other. He couldn't find anybody who could compare with these four Jewish lads. Now verse 21, and I'm going to have to wind this up. And Daniel <coughs> continued, that is, in his service to these pagan governments. <coughs> Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now, if you've never heard it before, you're going to hear me teach it as plain as I know how in the first few programs. Who was King Cyrus? Well, he was the king of the next empire coming, the Medes and the Persians. All right, what did Cyrus do? Cyrus wrote the decree that the Jews had full freedom to go back to Jerusalem. He gave them all that they need from the forests of Lebanon. He gave them absolute protection as they traveled so that they could rebuild the temple and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and get things cranked up and going for next great event, which was what? The first coming of Christ. All right, so now here we go. Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel down into Babylon in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And so Daniel covered the whole scope of the 70 years of captivity. He was already 12 or 14 when he went down there. So how old is he? 80. And then he goes, have I got time? Yeah, I think I got time. Go to the last part of Daniel. <coughs> Mm. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but anyway, he's going to stay in his place of authority until long after Cyrus sends the decree to send the Jews back. So where does that put Daniel? Probably 90 years old. And all that time he's been serving in a pagan government and never let it defile him. All right, now what is that for us? That's what Paul means, that all these things are written for our learning, and they're written for our profit. How are we to operate in a system that is totally against us? We never compromise. Don't ever compromise your faith. Begin to be willing to do what Jonah did and walk the plank before you compromise these biblical truths. Now we're living in a time, I just, somebody sent us a paper the other day, maybe I mentioned it last program, I think I did, where 70% of American Christians think everybody's going to heaven. How can they? Impossible. Oh, thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.